And now for the event today, uh, Maritas Vitug is joining us from the Philippines to talk about corruption, something that she knows a lot about in her years as an investigative journalist there. I asked Maritas over lunch how long she's been a journalist, and she said, feels like about 100 years. <laughs> I think I know that feeling. Also, today's speech is about going after the big fish, and I did notice that she had fish for lunch today as well. <laughs> so uh, Maritas, who has many years experience in investigative journalists and now writes for Rappler.com, she is the author of several books on the subject of corruption in Philippines. She'll have a, some speaking time and also leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Maritas. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm going to speak about corruption in the Philippines, uh, attempts of the current president, Benigno or Noy Noy Aquino, Noy Noy is his nickname, to go after the big fish. So let me start from 2010, that was two years ago, when President Gloria Arroyo left office. Since then, we've seen changes, both in style and substance. So first, about style. The part about President Benigno Aquino's inaugural speech that resonated with many Filipinos was his no wang wang policy. Wang wang refers to blaring sirens used by VIPs to skirt Manila's notorious traffic. Um, suddenly, after that inaugural speech, our streets were free of wang wangs as citizens with their cell phone cameras took photos of cars violating this new policy, reported this to TV networks, and uploaded them on the web. Wang Wang also symbolically referred to the elite, the VIPs, and the vested interests who demand special favors or treatment when it comes to contracts, appointments to offices, and other transactions with government. So far, the good news is the president has not been embroiled in any scandal involving giving favors to vested interests. So more on his style. Before the president moved to Malacanang Palace, he lived in his mother's house in the suburb of Quezon City, which meant he had to go through Manila streets daily to report to work. It took many by surprise that the presidential convoy stopped at red lights and his security guards would stand outside the president's car and be on full alert. Once the president even opened his glass window, his security people were in a daily nightmare. The no wang wang policy and the example set by Noy Noy, we call him that or Pinoy for President Noy, of observing traffic lights, of not demanding any special treatment has sent ripples. If you go to the Philippines, the international airport is a good laboratory. Airport personnel say traffic is no longer held up by VIPs with their backup cars because they have no longer wang wangs with them. Chris Aquino, the president's famous movie and TV celebrity sister, and his other sisters queue to check in for security. Check. Dropping old practice, former President Arroyo and her husband had to queue at the airport and they had to undergo body check, just like everyone else. Reporters went to town with this story. So as for the president's lifestyle, it's quite simple. He rarely dines in five-star hotels and fine dining restaurants. On the day Congress proclaimed him winner of the presidential race, he and his staff celebrated in a noisy and inexpensive Chinese restaurant beside a supermarket. One day, he was late for a morning appointment because he said he couldn't sleep the night before. So we were all a bit irritated, but he explained that where he lived at the time, Quezon City, experienced a blackout and he didn't have a generator. When he visited the U.S. early on in his term, I think it was in 2010 or early 2011, he deliberately left his cell phone in the Philippines, he said, because he didn't want additional expenses on his roaming account. The U.S. trip was his first overseas visit in 11 years. At the time he became president, he had an expired passport. So I'm a bit worried about foreign policy here. And the most publicized story about his visit, which even the Vietnamese press carried, was his hot dog meal in New York. 
Lunch for him and those who accompanied him, cabinet members and secretary, cost a total of 54 U.S. dollars. The subtext is, this is a great contrast to former President Arroyo's dinner at a Tony restaurant in New York, which cost taxpayers 20,000 U.S. dollars, or roughly equivalent of 1 million pesos. So nothing about Noi Noi eating hot dog or hamburger is scripted. That's really his bad, unhealthy diet, coupled with regular Coke. While this is largely about style, it's also about a culture that is slowly seeping in. It's about not flaunting power. It's about the meaning of being in public office. In a country like ours that is steeped in class consciousness, this counts for something. Now to the substance. Aquino campaigned on an anti-corruption platform. He linked corruption to poverty reduction, and his slogan, which until today uh, we, keep, we keep reminding him is, I'll say this in Filipino, kung walang korap, walang mahirap. Translated to English, if there are no corrupt people, there are no poor people. And he won by an overwhelming vote, the largest election mandate in post-Marcos history. He became president because of his political pedigree and the unpopularity of his predecessor. His mother, Corazon Aquino, was squeaky clean and honest, former president, but failed to provide lasting reforms. She was our transition president, bridging our shift from authoritarian rule in the 70s and early 80s to a democracy in 1986. When she died, a wave of nostalgia for honest leadership swept through the country, making her son, Noy Noy, the beneficiary. Aquino's father is the legendary politician Ninoy Aquino, who was assassinated by state forces because he was a threat to Marcos. Some consider Noy Noy our default president. The other choices had little going for them. Noy Noy is the opposite of Gloria Arroyo, honest, simple, lots of good intentions. And Arroyo was the most unpopular post-Marcos president we ever had. So Aquino keeps mentioning his mantra today, which is daang matuwid, or the straight path, as opposed to the crooked and corrupt path. So far, he has gone after former President Arroyo and a few of her cronies. Let me just cite briefly the cases. The ombudsman, our graft buster, filed plunder charges against Mrs. Arroyo in July. She allegedly misused 325 million pesos or $8 million of Philippine Charity Sweepstakes Office funds, apparently for the elections. As you know, Arroyo is out on bail after eight months of hospital arrest. But if the plunder charges prosper, she may be sent to prison. Just as a historical footnote, former President Joseph Estrada was the first ex-president to be convicted for plunder. Other pending cases against Arroyo include her alleged misuse of 536 million pesos of the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration funds to finance her election campaign in 2004. The diversion of 728 million pesos from the fertilizer funds of the Agriculture Department also to finance her presidential campaign. And her involvement in the overpriced $329 million national broad broadband network project with China's ZTE telecoms firm. This became a huge scandal in the Philippines. The other big fish that President uh, Noy Noy Aquino has gone after is the Chief Justice of the Philippine Supreme Court, Renato Corona. He was impeached and convicted, a first in our country's history. Corona did not declare some of his assets and underdeclared others. Last month, the Bureau of Internal Revenue filed a tax evasion case against Corona. He needs to pay at least 120 million pesos or about $3 million in taxes. The asset statement is an ordinary form which public officials are required to fill up. And this has become now one of the biggest anti-corruption tools in the country. It is now made public and citizens can follow their public officials if they've indeed increased their wealth just using the asset statement, assets and liability statement as an indicator. 
While initially this, the impeachment of the Chief Justice divided the country, it turned out that majority supported it after Aquino's, as shown in Aquino's popularity ratings. His, uh, he has struck the um, highest satisfaction rating so far uh, last month. Also, a four-feature case against Corona is pending with the Ombudsman. Another big fish who has been charged with electoral sabotage is a crony of Arroyo, Mr. Benjamin Abalos, former com elections commissioner. And another political ally of Arroyo, a former congressman, faces tax evasion charges. However, doing this wasn't easy at first for President Aquino. Barely had he warmed his seat in 2010 when a legal assault on his anti-corruption agenda began. Allies of former President Arroyo rushed the Supreme Court to question Aquino's first executive order, creating the Truth Commission. So his EO number one was to form a fact-finding body inspired by that of South Africa that would dig into the excesses of the nine-year Arroyo regime. However, it would delve into corruption cases and not uh, human rights issues. But the Supreme Court, composed of a majority of appointees of former President Arroyo, declared EO number one unconstitutional. The court kills Aquino's first executive order and this led to the most open and contentious clash between the executive department and the judiciary. Next, the court stopped the impeachment of the ombudsman who was loyal to the former president. She did not act on corruption cases against Arroyo and her allies. But the court changed its mind and allowed Congress to proceed with the impeachment. Public opinion may have influenced the court. Now let me talk about transparency, which is... Uh, supposed to be a policy of President Aquino. During his campaign, he vowed to be transparent. During Aquino's nine years as president, she was quite economical with press conferences and interviews, especially after the opposition tried to impeach her. In her last few years in office, she refused to answer questions about politics and rarely met with the press. Transparency in government was at a low, especially when it came to big contracts. This is changing slowly. In unprecedented moves, which other democracies take for granted, the Philippine Executive Department, for example, the Public Works Department, Interior Department, they're now uploading information on their website, which before was difficult to access, such as their budgets, how they spend this, monthly status of infrastructure projects. The Budget Department is releasing re real-time how much money they give as pork barrel to each of our congressmen. So now we can follow this pork barrel's flow and ask the congressmen how they spend it. But the rest of the departments have yet to follow. President Aquino is candid in his press conferences and he is his own moderator. He thinks aloud, sometimes confusing us, and says things that are not yet final nor policy. But we think this is better than keeping information away from the public. However, one of the disappointments is he has not pushed for the passage of the Freedom of Information Bill, which is currently pending in our Congress. If passed, this bill will, be, will make it easy to access information. As of now, access to documents is very iffy. It depends on whom journalists know in the various institutions. So what are the prospects for anti-corruption reforms under the Aquino government? Man, many of us Filipinos expect justice, but the record of failure to prosecute successfully the Marcos family and their cronies shows a politicized legal system. Joseph Estrada was convicted of plunder, but got immediately pardoned by Gloria Arroyo for fear that she may suffer the same fate. Aquino has tremendous political capital. His satisfaction rating is at an all-time high of 67% as of last month. And this is already his second year in office. But his weaknesses are clear. He's not a strategic thinker nor a visionary. And second, he has a soft spot for friends and people he's comfortable with. Sometimes friendship trumps competence and merit. However, one of his friends, the Undersecretary for Interior, was forced to resign recently after being embroiled 
an anomalous arms deal. Overall, though, the cabinet is largely doing well, a mix of technocrats, professional managers, advocates, and career, career officials. But it's the office of the president that suffers from a competence deficit. So can the system be changed? The president has said that changing the system is his central goal, referring to the excesses of the Arroyo government. But more than this, institutions in the Philippines need to be strengthened. The World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report for 2011 to 2012 showed that the Philippines has weak institutions. The judiciary is vulnerable to influence from powerful people. Public trust of politicians is very low. Bribes are still common. Decisions of government officials at times show favoritism. This same report from the World Economic Forum shows that the most problematic factors for doing business are corruption, inefficient government bureaucracy, and inadequate supply of infrastructure. Yet some reforms can take place within the system. For example, the Finance Department and the Bureau of Internal Revenue have run after tax evaders. The Bureau of Customs is going after smugglers. The Trans Transport and Communications Department and the Public Works Department stopped unbidded contracts. The Public Works and Interior Departments, as I mentioned earlier, have now, are now quite transparent, and you can follow their budgets and expenses on their websites, as well as the status of infrastructure projects, something other democracies do as routine. Aquino has stepped up his anti-poverty efforts with the World Bank-supported Conditional Cash Transfer Program that reaches more people. This was started during the Arroyo government, and it's hugely successful in Latin America, like Mexico and Brazil. This is now the inspiration for the Philippines' uh, Conditional Cash Transfer Program. But Aquino needs to use his tremendous and huge political capital to push for tough reforms. Pending now in our Congress is a sin tax bill, uh, which will increase taxes for alcohol and tobacco, but it's meeting with very uh, stiff resistance from tobacco companies. Another pending bill is the, we call it the Reproductive Health Bill, which will uh, make sex education compulsory in public and it will make contraceptives available to a lot of our poor uh, couples. So president needs to use his capital to push for these tough reforms. Sometimes he tends to be bold in his rhetoric. His actions sometimes fall short. Aquino likes to say that he wants to change the status quo, and I quote, he said, to disturb some people's rice bowls. He has four more years to do, his, to do this, and we're eagerly watching and expecting results. Thank you, and good day. Thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions and answers. If you'd raise your hand, give us your name and your affiliation if you're with an organization. Who'd like to start? Over here. I don't know if this is on. Uh, it's Vodine, England, uh, previously in the Philippines. Um, the judiciary, you said, was politicized and that connection between corruption and poverty. Uh, one of the biggest cases that you haven't mentioned, which is not specifically about corruption, but involves a lot, I think, the, the massacre in Maguindanao. Mm. Um, it's a case where justice seems increasingly unlikely because people get paid off or killed off. Am I right? Yes, uh, that's also one uh, black spot because the case has not been resolved and some witnesses have been killed have, uh, and some have gone missing. So there's a lot of uh, clamor for this to be resolved. It's an example, it's an example that President Aro uh, I mean Aquino can, uh, can show about uh, reforming the judiciary, but um, he just appointed a new chief justice, so it will take time before reforms seep into the judiciary. As you know, the Philippines is a very personality-oriented, a leader-oriented country. Uh, we still need to grow into a um, society wherein institutions, reforms are embedded in the institutions so that whoever takes over 
can run the institution smoothly and can um, effect reforms immediately. So yes, it's still we're still waiting for the resolution of that uh, the massacre of 50 plus people in Maguindanao. Over here. Thanks, uh, Emily Rahala from Time Magazine. Thank you for your talk. Um, also on the topic of judicial reform, um, some of the president's critics say that his handling of the corona case um, constituted a breach of the division between the different branches of government. Uh, I'm wondering what you think about his handling of the corona case and the, the status of the highest court going forward. Um, it's, yeah, it's no secret that he, his, the executive department helped the prosecutors who belong to another branch of government, Congress, in uh, mm. pushing for the impeachment of the Chief Justice. But uh, that's true. He crossed the line, but it became highly popular because it led to a successful uh, conviction of the Chief Justice. Now, the thing is for the President to now realize that this is a separate branch of government and that he should not, be a, should not have comfortable relations with this department. Uh, but he appointed a chief justice whom he's comfortable with, so there's that criticism that uh, he should keep the, indi the judiciary independent and not try to influence it. So that still remains to be seen. Yeah. But uh, people are, watchdogs are aware of this. Mayor, Kathy. I'm Kathy Yang of Reuters TV. I work with uh, Tara. Um, no doubt, um, a lot of the investment strategists and investors are taking a second look at the Philippines for it being the flavor of Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. In fact, it is the fastest growing next to China at north of 6%. It looks good numbers wise, but when you live there as a journalist, as a local journalist, you know that there's a lot of poverty still. A lot of the uh, remittances that come to our country is the one that powers our GDP. Yeah. But that carries a social cost. I'm wondering as a journalist, what to you in your years as a journalist would be a benchmark for you to say, we have improved? The numbers mm. have improved, yes, but for you as a journalist, you talk to people, what would it be? Yeah. What, what benchmark would you use? Yeah. Um, I think it's when some of our Filipinos abroad start coming back to find jobs in the Philippines. Yesterday I had a, a very uh, productive and exciting meeting with some of the Filipinos here, and they say that they really want to come back to the Philippines because they're separated from their families. So I think if there are more jobs available, if the economic growth can be more equitable so that um, some of those who, have, who still want to come back can come back and find jobs, I think that will be a very good sign. But as of now, um, I don't think it will take a few years. It will take a longer time, uh, even beyond President Aquino, to improve um, our economy for, be for everyone, for at uh, most of our poor people, to be able to enjoy equal opportunities. Over here, and then we'll... I'm Jane Singer from Inside Fashion, and. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Um, I do have one question with regard to um, transparency and um, moving away from corruption. With regard to, to business, either you know, within the country or people who are, are importing and exporting from the country, have significant changes trickled down from the changes that are taking place at the government level? Trickled down up to the... To day-to-day -day business. In other words, mm. you've mentioned that there have been very impressive reforms mm. at a high governmental level. But mm. on a regular, you know, day-to-day, -day, if you're either within the country working, um, you know, running, running a business, or if you're someone who's trying to import products mm. from there, sourcing there, or people selling in, mm. has that significantly impacted at that level yet, do you believe? Not yet. In fact, uh, as maybe this morning there was a Philippine, there was an economic... Uh, briefing in the Philippines this morning, and that was one of the areas, one of the questions raised was, we still need a more efficient one-stop shop for business uh, people to go to, for businessmen to go to. It's, it's a reality in some areas, but not in all. So the momentum has, is there. 
hopefully the implementation will be much, much faster. Yes. Question back here. Hi, Marites. Isabel Escoda, occasional contributor to the Philippine Inquirer. Uh, I was in Manila recently, and I wonder if you could give your view on the story about the Belgian company that had been signed up to uh, do the dredging in Laguna de Bay. Uh, and Noi Noi, President Noi Noi, apparently backed out from that after all the feasibility studies had been made and uh, they were all set to go. And so the Belgian company is suing. I was told this briefly by an economist friend. Uh, and I wonder if, uh, as you know, uh, Laguna is still underwater. And every time it rains, so many parts of Manila and the provinces are flooded. Um, and why did Noi Noi stop this contract? Is there any corruption involved, you think, in this? Uh, thanks for that question, but I haven't looked into it, although I heard uh, that there was supposed to be an overprice. But we still have to check this. Uh, there might be vested interest at play. So I'll promise to look into it when I get back. Thank you. Over here. Murray Burton. Um, back on the uh, corona impeachment, etc., um, there's a view that that was very political on behalf of uh, Ninoy because, I mean, he's gone on immediately to replace him by um, a lady who is firmly in the Aquino camp in, and an ally in the Luisita land battle against the family. So that's the first thing. Also, she's far from being the best qualified for the job of those who are ap applying. Um, and so that's one of the things also. It's ironical, of course, that many of the senators who voted to impeach Corona refused to disclose their own international transactional financial dealings when asked to do so. So that's one thing. And also on the Ampudian family massacre, I mean, what do you think is actually going to be the outcome of the criminal charges? I mean, they live with impunity in and out of jail, rather like Tommy Suharto did in Indonesia when he was in prison. They have total control of their own uh, resources. So one can't be optimistic that the, the, the so-called corruption forces, anti-corruption forces at Bay are going to do anything in that regard. So on the, on the Ampatuans, yeah. yes, um, yes, we're get, actually, it's been two years, I think, two years since the massacre. And uh, it's it's very difficult for them to go scot-free. That's the, uh, the evidence is there, the pressure is there. It's just, just that it's taking too long and uh, the results are very slow. So surprisingly, uh, it has not uh, sustained, this issue has not been sustained in the, in the local media. And um, well, I think, but I, I cannot see I cannot foresee them going away scot-free. It will be very difficult, and it will be a, a black eye also on the, the current government. And yeah, I, I, your comments are valid on the political process of the impeachment. Over here. Thank you. Uh, lovely presentation, enjoyed it. Um, talk about Big Fish, the, the, the name that wasn't mentioned I thought may come up was uh, obviously the Marcos family. Uh, and, and given the history and, and the sort of decline of the Philippines sort of post-Marcos, uh, what, what is the president's position on that? And uh, as I say, we talk about Scott Free. Um, most of the family, as I can see it now, are running Congress or governors and uh, walking around with uh, absolute impunity. Yeah. Unfortunately, the... Cases against the Marcoses started in 1986. Until today, we have not seen uh, the major cases resolved. And the Philippines is quite a forgiving country because how can the children of this former president who ruled us for 14 years under martial law, how can their children win public office? But they are in public office. Aimee, the daughter, is governor of Ilocos. The son, Bongbong, or Ferdinand Marcos Jr., is one of our senators. 
and he plans to run for president in 2016 or maybe later. Uh, Imelda is not in public office, but she used to be in Congress. So we are celebrating our 40th year of martial law in Septem on September 21. And we have campaign slogans of never again to remind the younger generation of the atrocities of martial law and that they should not vote for any Marcos in office. But you know, it's, that's, I think the, the public opinion generally uh, in the middle class and the older generation is against the Marcoses. So uh, President Aquino has always said that the cases against the Marcoses should prosper, but I don't think there's much that can be done anymore after 30 plus years. Yeah. Just a quick one for me, if I may. You talk, and we're all sensing the winds of change in Philippines, mm. and you talk about the institutions really needing to be more solid. Mm. Is that happening in a way that we can see it change within a decade? Do you think the, the wind has moved to a point where it's not going to change back? Uh, it's hard to say, but I think it's just starting. So it's um, President Arroyo, I think weakened the institutions. He was there for nine years. So to rebuild them, uh, it will take longer than the six years of President Aquino. And um, whoever will be the next president should do more or continue or do better. So it's very crucial for us to vote for a good president in 2016. Mm. Over here. I think you said that um, Kino took on the church in terms of introducing uh, sex education uh, laws. H how big a battle was that and how important is that? It's very important in the Philippines. Uh, the, the church is only for, the church is a very powerful influence in the Philippines. In the pulpit, some priests, some bishops endorse candidates. Uh, campaign for candidates. So these politicians who are who want to win in our midterm elections next year are scared to vote in favor of this reproductive health bill. It is uh, a, a giant step if the bill is passed because it will show that there is a uh, that we are a secular society after all. Uh, it's a big battle. Unfortunately, I see or many of us see politicians succumbing to the pressure of the Catholic Church. And I think the reproductive health bill will just fade away. Yeah. We had a question over here. Um, <clears throat> following on from your comment that Bong Bong Marcos may run in 2016, is there anyone that you can see who Aquino is grooming now to carry on his anti-corruption platform post his term? Uh, he has, well, it's not been official yet, but I think he's going to endorse his, uh, one of his cabinet members, uh, Mar Rojas, to run in 2016, but that's not yet certain. He was his uh, vice presidential candidate in 2010, and they bo both belong to the Liberal Party, but his ratings are not good compared to our vice president, uh, Jeju Mar Binay, who already has announced his plans to run in 2016. Mm. Manuel Rojas III. Yeah. He's now our interior secretary. Yeah. Any more questions from the floor? Yeah. We have one over here. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Just to, you know, take a more skeptical view. Aquino has gone after his enemies. And in some countries, like take the Ukraine, where a former president was thrown into jail, there was a lot of negative media attention. One of Noy Noy's successes is to portray his, uh, you know, uh, putting the former president on trial, going after the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice, who was her ally, uh, as an anti-corruption drive. But, you know, the question comes beyond going after his enemies and appointing his friends to replace them, rather than the best qualified, where are really the systematic reforms that we can point to? The second question is, you know, Arroyo's reputation has been blackened, but the economy did quite well under her presidency, infrastructure development in particular. 
And there's been some reports that infrastructure projects are actually slowing at the moment, and they haven't kept up the pace. The, the, the flood prevention was one uh, indication of that. And, uh, you know, th the question is, is he really just profiting from the very negative image that his predecessor had? And, and is he really showing the kind of output that, that, that lead us to really appreciate him as a reformer? Yeah. Uh, wow, that's really a tough question. But that <laughs> strikes at the heart of the issue. Actually, yes, he, he's, he's profiting from the opposite. He's being an, portraying himself as an opposite of the former president. That's, that's, that's a, a fact. Is he really going to, be assist, to reform the system? Uh, I don't see that happening in his six years. He's just planting the seeds. And um, you know, our, our problem maybe uh, with the president is he has not had experience in leading any institution. He was a congressman and a senator. So it's, it's different. Uh, leading this entire, uh, this country is very different from just being a congressman and senator. So. Uh, I, as I said, he, he's not very strategic, unlike President Ramos, who in the 1990, during his term, uh, brought down monopolies, leveled the playing field. Maybe we should see more of this, but uh, it's not yet happening. So what we're seeing under Aquino is really just a start, just uh, setting a momentum, setting the tone. I think it's more setting the tone so that people will expect better and bigger reforms. So this will take maybe two more presidents, I, I'm assuming, after Aquino, for us to see really big changes. Two more good presidents. Yeah. Well, I, have, I, I just have one more question, and that is, um, in your opinion, um, in, in terms of um, sort of pushing through uh, some of the political reform. What role do you see a significant amount of, of, of uh, foreign investment playing? In other words, if the Philippines were to get a significant amount of foreign investment such that it really builds up the job opportunities at home, and particularly, you know, higher level job opportunities, do you see that as playing an important role in, in helping push forward some of these reforms and changes? I think uh, if there is increase in foreign direct investments, definitely to help prop up the help improve the Philippine economy, help provide more jobs. Uh, the thing is, will this, uh, as you said, help improve uh, the push against corruption? I think it all depends on how vigilant I think the public is. You know, uh, there is a disconnect actually between the in this situation. We have so many Filipinos working abroad, and they're, expi they're, they're exposed to efficient, good governance, honest systems, I mean, different parts of the world. Yet they don't uh, translate, uh, transmit these demands to the Philippines. You know, their, their children, their relatives, or they themselves don't uh, clamor for these reforms in the Philippines. So uh, there's some kind of disconnect, but we hope that uh, Pe people who live in the Philippines will really clamor for this reform so, and choose the right leader so that um, we will see a, a continuation of reforms. Otherwise, next year will be our midterm elections. If we will vote again for you know, movie stars or uh, scions of old political families, they're not necessarily bad, but we need to open the political space more. We need to see you know, new names, people ha who, who work in maybe NGOs or the private sector. It's very difficult for them to join politics because they don't have the money, they're not well known, and our political parties are weak. So there are a lot of factors at play. Thank you for that. Um, to Jane's point and to your answer, I just wanted to ask, what is the thrust in terms of education so that the young ones will better understand the clamor for reform so that they'll be in a better position to make informed decisions so that they'll have the level of expectation to ask that question of government what is being done in the edu in the yeah. education of our youth well uh, i i don't think there's any specific uh, measure or reform i think it's just to 
re to make education as accessible as possible to all, especially the poor, but as to um, instilling in them as a culture that will clamor for reforms, I don't think there's anything specific about that. That's why um, we would like to see more literature also in the Philippines about how gov people in government were able to push for reforms despite vested interests. The Philippines is a country of vested interests. You know, uh, a few families control the wealth, you know this. And uh, that's why it's a battle always to make it a level, an equitable level playing field. We have time for just two more questions, so we'll start here. Uh, Ernst Herb, I work for Finance Bureau, a Swiss business newspaper. Uh, just a, qu a follow up on what you just mentioned. You said it's a country of vested interests, and we know that the president is coming from one of these families, quasi feudal families, that run the country, that shares the wealth of it. And we know. Fi uh, Corruption is slowing growth, and we see this in other countries around the region, but nevertheless, they grow considerably faster in the Philippines. Do you think there's a potential for the president to become a traitor of his class and introduce significant, significant reform to uh, allow level playing fields of all participants in the economic system? Or is he just defending, at the end, yeah. the, the interests of his own people? Well. I'll I'll just, well, um, again, that's a difficult question, but to cite an example, under, it was on, it's only now under President Aquino that his, last, his family's vast land holding will finally be distributed to the farmers. This has never, I mean, this is the first time. And uh, I think to give him some credit, he did not influence, he did not try to influence the court. In the past, uh, the court you know, was influenced by either the Kohuancos or the political enemies of the Kohuancos. So now, for the first time, our Supreme Court ordered that the land, 5,000 hectares, the biggest single land hold, agricultural land holding in the Philippines, will be distributed to the farmers. What's going to be settled only is the price of, of each uh, hectare. So in that sense, um, he has uh, been successful. He did not at all push the court or try to influence the court as to the longer term of um, you know uh, leveling the playing field that we, we still haven't haven't seen that it, it's a lack of strategic plan on this that uh, we're missing we have time for just one more question and uh, we'll take two and Vodine, go ahead thank you just quickly um, I wanted you to tell us why you wrote the book that's on sale there and uh, what it's all about. Why Thank you for allowing me to plug my book. <laughs> that's why I wanted to ask you. <laughs> You're a dear friend. <laughs> no, actually, I brought a few copies of my latest book. It's called Hour Before Dawn. I chronicle what I consider to be the darkest hour of the Philippine Supreme Court, wherein there was a justice, a chief justice who was called a midnight chief justice because he was appointed despite uh, the ban on appointing at any official during the election period. Um, and then I try to chronicle the reversals, the flip-flops of the court, and this famous case wherein a justice plagiarized a decision. Uh, he never apologized, he never resigned, and the Supreme Court cleared him and they blamed Microsoft Word. <laughs> so that Took, uh, that really grabbed international attention. So I write about. It. Anyway, it's a, uh, it's I, that's why it's hour before dawn. But there's some hope. Um, uh, I hope that it will make the public more aware, at least the Filipinos, about the need for more reforms in our Supreme Court. And just one more quick question here. Um, uh, just one very short, direct question. Uh, you're telling the Filipinos how to take care of themselves. What do the stupid guailos do to <laughs> avoid the corruption in the Philippines? Let me give you a case. Uh, a moment ago, somebody asked about Laguna, uh, the village of my domestic helper, who's been with me for 14 years, was destroyed um, a week ago. I wanted to send some money there, and she said, don't send it to the government. So... I called a number of my friends who all contributed to a sum of money. 
she contacted many domestic helpers who contributed an even greater sum of money. How could we send it? We sent it, in fact, to someone we knew in the village, and we're recording with receipts and film and uh, with snapshots of people getting the food we're sending. But how do people deal with that? Because we know if we send it to the government, it's going to go into somebody's pocket. Yeah, I think, I guess you did the right thing. I think it's best also to work, it's for uh, immediate contacts or immediate help like that, it's best to go directly to the communities. Nothing beats uh, direct contact. But I think f uh, a lot of foreign businesses in the Philippines, uh, they have signed up with the Philippine businessmen, a so-called covenant or integrity covenant that they would report briberies. I hope we'll have to see results that they report people who accept bribes or at least demand or extort, and they, they promise not to pay bribes. It's a good step, but we still have to see results. A lot of the multinationals signed up, including uh, big business. It's called the Integrity Initiative. So that's a good start. Uh, people need to know, you know, uh, in India, they have a website called ipaidabribe.com. And it's really visited by millions of people. We want to do something like that in the Philippines. It's anonymous, but you could track down where this uh, bribes, bribe giving is taking place. Uh, that's now a start, starting now in the Philippines. Marita Svitouk, thanks very much for your time today. We have a small gift from the FCC okay. to thank you for, thank and we do hope you'll come back and tell us how things are going in a couple of years. And thanks to everyone for coming today.